Anna Gabriel Mann, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. I'm so happy to be here and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I know, I'm looking forward. I'm also looking backward because we, we kept having to stop ourselves from having it in preparation because we're just both so eager to talk about these issues. Um, before we get there, can you, for people who hadn't met you from the, the episode a few weeks ago, can you uh, re or introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, I'm a clinically trained therapist and I'm also a coach. And I gave up doing couples therapy in lieu of working with individuals many years ago uh, because I really believe that it's the individual who can move the needle the close, the farthest in any relationship, whether it's with your child, with your parent, with your sibling, with your kids, I mean, uh, with your spouse. And I also feel that. Um, you know, each one of us has to self-examine and grow. Um, and that's one of the fundamentals of the book my husband and I wrote is, how do you really personally grow? What are you willing to really take on and look at in yourself that will change the scope and the range of all your relationships? Right. And we, we, got, we got to be good at marketing here, right? In, in honor, in honor <laughs> of John. Your husband. So the book is called The Go-Giver Marriage. Yes, the go-giver marriage. And it's, it's based on five principles. Um, and the five principles really are based in not only developmental theory, but they're based in neurobiology. They're based in the idea that when you change the way that you behave, the whole entire tone of everything changes. And also when you change the way you think, which is more of a cognitive behavioral model, you also change the way that you look at the situation. So in all relationships, but particularly in marriages, it's where all our material from the past rises and any of the patterns and behaviors and adaptations that we had to make as a child in order to survive all rise up and say, hello. Hmm. So I wanna talk about adaptations because I'm starting to understand it in I think a more sophisticated way. Thanks to when we were talking offline a few weeks ago, you mentioned um, this um, summit by, led by Terry Reel, the uh, couples therapist, and he talks a lot about the adaptive child. Um, I'm also find, I'm realizing that I, I know you said this that you 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 used to do couples therapy. Now you just work with individuals, and I'm just finding it ironic that you send me to Terry Reel, who says I only do individual work in relationships. <laughs> Practically, like that's like right. so that's really interesting. But well, I, I like to frame the whole thing as we were talking about in the the tension or the synergy i'm not even sure which between past and future so you know as a, as a psychologist the tradition of psychology in the west is like freud you know sit on the couch and tell me about your mother or free associate right which is very yeah. deeply psychological we're both no. coaches in which we're looking forward and there's ways in which i think in the coaching community we can become so forward focused that we miss some things in the past that, that could be helpful, that could be useful yes. reflections. And as I, I'm not a therapist, I don't exactly know where the line is. So I'd like for this conversation, not just to be for coaches and therapists, but for humans in general who are thinking about how much of my past is relevant to the things I want to accomplish in the future. And, and, and if some of it is, or all of it is, how do I go there without wallowing, without becoming a victim, without feeling like it's predetermined uh, my limits? And that's so that's kind of the, the broad scope of the, the guidance I would love to elicit from you today. Absolutely. Well, first, I would say that in my coaching model, um, I believe that everyone made a key decision between 18 months of age and 24 months of age when they were first sort of individuating. That's the first step in individuation. It's the first moment where you really start to grasp that you are separate from your parents, you are separate from your siblings, you are your own individual, and you are making decisions about the world at that point. And so in a state of either fight, flight, or freeze, you make a decision, a key decision about the world. And that decision colors everything for the rest of your life. So and if it came in the fight category, you're somebody who has a 
sort of a fighting chip on your shoulder about how people behave and how things happen in the world and how they happen to you. And you might have a kind of um, not necessarily aggressive style, but a critical viewpoint that, that, it, that is sort, sort of the lens that you see through. If it happened in a freeze state, there's more confusion in your life. You're always trying to figure things out, but you never quite feel clear. If it happened in a flight state, um, there's more anxiety underneath this decision and it colors your sense of self. So all of those, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm opening a Pandora's box and confusing you, but <laughs> I believe that all good coaches, and, and this is where I'll take it, Howie, all good coaches really are, are good at questions. They're, they're coaching alongside of you. And they're sometimes coaching in front of you, and they're sometimes coaching from behind you. Mm. So they're, they're supporting you to move forward, but they're alongside of you asking really pertinent, really strong questions. So let's say, for example, I have a client, and he's really struggling because he just, you know, he, he's just really intensely critical of, critical of everything and everybody in his life. And he mm. sort of feels like it's a pattern and a habit, and he can't get out of it. The question is, how does this, how does criticism serve you? How does this habit serve you? And it gets people talking and exploring. I know you have a question. I can see it. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always. That's, I'm a good coach. Okay. Right? <laughs> um, it gets people see, looking and exploring because when you ask somebody about their history, you know, who was, if you're critical, then who was critical of you? Hmm. A lot of times you'll immediately see somebody sit back in their chair and say, oh, well, hey, I grew up under criticism, you know, on steroids. You know, my parents were critical. My grandparents were critical. And I, but I had one parent in particular and they'll, they'll, they'll summarize it for you. They'll give it to you really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it just, it opens the door to the awareness because awareness is the first step in really understanding how does this behavior serve you or not serve you? And can you catch yourself in the moment and go, oh, there I am again. And how can I take a breath? You know, I mean, a lot of therapy models will try to teach couples and individuals that when you're under stress, when you're in that difficult moment, stop, take a breath. Give yourself a little breathing room, if you will, before you react. Mm -hmm. So trying to help people to get control of those issues. All right. So there, yeah, you're right. There's a tremendous amount that I want to unpack here. Um, the first the first question is like those three are all aspects of the, you know, the neurology of of protection, right? Of danger awareness. Are you saying that this happens to everyone regardless of whether they they had you know, trauma, like, you know, a child of really good parents is still going to have to choose one of these states. And are they, are they like, you know, default states or just states that occur in stress? Well, let me put it this way. By the time you're a year and a half, every last human on earth knows how daddy feels about mommy. They know how mommy feels about daddy. They know which child is the favorite child in the family and which one isn't. They understand the dynamic of what's going on, and they are making very keen decisions about how they feel about it all. That's all I'm saying. When I frame it in fight, flight, or freeze, it's a particular style that this child develops. You know, some kids will, and it doesn't have to have trauma at all. It's just in reaction to what's happening in the family. If there's a lot of chaos and a lot of emotional you know, yelling if one of the parents is alcoholic, whatever. There's There may be a freeze component for this child because they're just trying to stay out of the line of fire. It isn't about trauma for them per se. It's simply a, their emotional reaction. What's their style? Are they are they fighters? Have they always been fighters? Even at the year of age where they just, you know, slamming their fist on the table and saying mine? Um, or, you know, are they more in reaction to what's happening. So it's more of a flight. Um, and, and so I, I share that simply because I, I have found that people really do develop um, a, a primary viewpoint that colors the way that they address 
a lot of situations. And you'll see it come in, you'll hear it in their language. You know, you'll ask people a question and they'll say, you know, gosh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I've thought about that a lot. I just don't know. Um, you know, and, and you'll see that, that that's part of their basic premise is that they, they made a decision in a freeze moment and it kind of paralyzed their knowing, if you will, and they still hold on to that stance. Hmm. Um, I mean, one of the things I, I'm thinking about now is, you know, so I, I have no recollection of my life at that point. And I think you know, the, the theory is that I'm not verbal, you know, I hadn't developed a verbal capacity to be able to, you know, to have storable memories. Um, so like, is, is, do we have access to those times or are we just looking at who we are now and kind of reverse engineering? I think that it's, um, for me, it's, you know, bringing a client toward their past is only about the integration with how it's serving them now. And I, so I'm not trying to go back to the 18 to 24 pe period of time and say, okay, this is the decision you made per se, and let's talk about that. Mm. That to me is like getting on the couch and doing psychotherapy in, in a way that I don't believe serves. But what I am trying to say is um, we all have adaptive patterns. So going back to the adaptive child, the adaptive child is the child who made an adaptation somewhere in that frame of time somewhere between 18 and 24 months, or somewhere between 18 and four years old. They made adaptations in order to survive the environment they were in. And those adaptations continue all the way through their childhood and into their adolescence and adulthood. So it becomes a pattern that you live with. So what I say often when I'm talking on podcasts just about the five secrets in our book is, is you know, the opposite of one of the secrets is criticism. And criticism is alive and well in lots of relationships. It's in the, it's in the boss employee arena. It's in the parent child arena. It's in the spouse spousal arena. And it's even in the best friend arena where, you know, somebody will say, well, gosh, do you always have to be so negative? Hmm. You know, whatever they say, but you know, criticism is just one of those habits that once people get into it, it's really easy to stay in it and to be looking for things to be critical of rather than looking always for things to be positive about or things to be appreciative or grateful for. So it is a neurological loop that you get into. That's the service of it. So when your adaptive child has made a decision and, and or an adaptation, that adaptation is still with you and you're carrying it in every aspect of your life, every aspect of your life. And the neurobiology of it is once you have awareness of it, and once you have an understanding of how to, how to move to the opposite side of it, how to breathe into it, how to lose your anxiety in the moment, um, it shifts everything because then you can start being proactive in your relationships and in your life in a way that serves keeping this pattern not only understood in a, and being aware of it, but really being able to have it be a best friend that you utilize to move forward in life in a much more powerful way. Yeah, because I'm, so I'm thinking, you know, anyone who spent any time around a toddler, let alone trying to raise one, it's 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 kind of horrifying to think that that kid in the cart who's like screaming and, and, and melting down because you won't get him the frosted flakes is in a sense running your emotional life when you're under stress. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I mean, coming back to criticism, I think that, um, you know, I just find that a lot of type A's, you know, type A people, high performance executives, high performance women that are, you know, really working hard in their career and doing great things um, are often people who make intense, strong decisions and who don't waste time, you know, assessing and, and sort of being doing critical analysis, if you will, in a way that I'm not certain always serves. Uh -huh. So I have a couple of questions. I'm going to write down once because I want to come to it later and not forget. Um, but a quick story about criticism. So I have a group of people that I've trained as coaches 
um, mostly in the health and wellness world, and, and one of them is a medical doctor. And we were we were at a group talking yesterday about like someone comes in who is paying for guidance and help and advice about how to eat better, and in the middle of the clinic session says, "I just I'm just going to eat whatever I want. This is you know." And the the person mm -hmm. I'm training, the doctor, it's like I just you know I just felt like I needed to be the parent in the room at that moment. And mm -hmm. so you know, so we talked about like what that would look like and what it would mean. And it turns out it would basically mean a form of criticism, right? A form of I know better than you, um, and you have to listen to me now. And you know, so I guess I I, I offer that in terms of. Like, if all, you know, if all of us have have um, struggles with various urges and impulses, and it it could be the toddler who's running those, but also as we see people who are engaged in self destructive behaviors, it's very easy for us to become a critical parent of them because it, it seems like that's the the part in them wants to play that game with the part in us. Does, it, does that sound fair? And well, I, I, I agree, but I would also say that you can only coach as deep as you go on your own. Mm. So I would also, my, my feeling would be that the coach really needs to examine their inner material in terms of what's driving them to feel like they need to be the critical parent in that moment. Mm. Um, because it isn't necessary to go there at all. I mean, it, I think you can actually work with that client by saying, oh, it's so tempting, isn't it? You know, and just kind of align with them, get alongside of them, and then be able to say, but how will that serve you? Yeah. And you've, you're paying to talk to me right now, I'm paying to be here. And so I just wanna, I wanna sit right next to you and I wanna be very comforting because I really understand what it's like to want those French fries with the garlic aioli, yum, <laughs> yum, <laughs> I'm in. Um, so commiserating with them, joining with them, you know, a lot of times I think, um, and this is something in the therapy model with couples, is that uh, with couples, there's, there's often, you know, of the two, there's one who we call the one down, and they're, they're more desperate for the relationship, and they're the, the one that takes the one down position. And the other one is the one up position. They're more aloof, they're more in control, um, so I find that, you know, in our personal lives, we do the same things. We make decisions where it's like, you know, I'm with this person who really wants me to, to, you know, do this, but I'm just going to do what I want. You know, it's a little more coming back to the fight or flight defiance. You know, it's, it's that pattern where they've decided, screw you, I'm going to do what I want. So in that moment, you can't try to point out that they're in this early childhood pattern. That's really not going to get you where you want to go. It's about joining with them around the impulse to not treat yourself well and to not take care of yourself. And then being able to help them through questions again, you know, how is that going to serve? You know, do you think it's going to serve? And, and, you know, how do you feel after you've, you know, you know that for three days in a row you had, you know, this kind of food, ethnic food and that kind of ethnic food. And you just, you know, went for hamburgers and French fries. And then, you know, you had a big shake in the middle of the afternoon. And then you had the, that tall sugary drink at Starbucks. And, you know, you realize after a few days you've gained weight, you're not feeling so well. You know, how does it make you feel? And do you, do you, you know, where's your, do you want to shift it? Because if they start really answering honestly, what I find is that they'll start telling you about the ways that they feel depressed about it all, the ways they feel out of control. Mm -hmm. And then there's always an opportunity, as a coach anyways, to really redirect them toward the places where they can feel in control and the, the minor steps rather than the major. Right. So but I think as a coach, you can never take that position of the critical parent. I, you need to listen because I, I know what's going on here. Yeah. And, you know, in my training, the just, you know, sort of trauma informed polyvagal theory, whenever, whenever I see someone in uh, fight or flight or freeze or fold, um, what I, what I feel like my job is to provide for them is safety in that moment. 
Exactly. Right. So like they, they didn't develop fight, flight or freeze because one day someone came and said, here's a here's three cards, pick one. Right. It was it was in moments of perceived uncertainty or lack of safety or threat that that this, you know, develops in the first place. So, it, would, you know, I think there's a way in which being in the doctor's office and perceiving that the doctor is going to make you give up your garlic fries with aioli triggers <laughs> that that th that. 18 month to 24 month uh, threat response, right? Like I'm under threat again, I agree. just like that. I agree. And at the same time, um, you know, none of it's, none of it serves moving forward. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's important to join with them and commiserate with them. And I also feel that everyone, including the doctor has that fight, flies, freeze, flight, fight, fly, flight, freeze, or fold perspective. And so I think that, um, you know, it's easy to, to get into the authority figure place. Mm -hmm. And some of the most, you know, some of the most successful executives that I coach and train are totally in the fight stance. That's why they get so much done. Uh -huh. All right. So that's what you talk about when you say like make, making that pattern your best friend. Well, I think that they've made the pattern something that they, you know, it is an adaptive pattern. They've made it work for them, but you'll find usually that in some places of their life, it's clearly not working. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I know a lot of high type A executives who are really, you know, kicking it at work in the best possible way. Their work life is really, really successful, but their personal life is a mess. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about like, you, you know, you pick one. But like I'm coaching someone who's a you know very high powered, brilliant executive, who like the the feedback it, for the to this person gets is sort of a little hesitant and indecisive, like you know brilliant um, analyst of data, always looking for more information, calm, thoughtful, credible, and so I'm I'm, I'm sort of uh, mapping that a little bit onto freeze. From, from what you said, but there's also like 10% of the, of the 360 feedback is this person can be explosive and highly critical. And I'm wondering if there's like an adaptation of an adaptation, like, you know, you're, you're, you're freeze for most of the time, but then at a certain point you become like, you know, Mike Tyson biting off somebody's ear. Uh, exactly. And there's tributaries to every single one of them. Usually everybody has, a primary place that they come from, and then they have, you know, sort of some tributaries in all the others. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely concur with that. Yeah. And, you know, going back to just bringing the, the so-called adaptive child and the history back in, I think that, you know, there's just a moment you can always see it in, in a coaching session where it's like, okay, so who, who was explosive and hurtful to you? You know, if you have these moments where you really go off on people, who did that to you? Okay. So, so and th that's a big part of what I want to discuss because I've never asked that question as a coach. P partly, well, I mean, we can explore the reasons that I haven't, but I haven't. But mm -hmm. let's say one, one of the modalities that I rely on is ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy or training. And ACT wouldn't do that. Act would just say, okay, you've got this thing. So when does it hook you? Let's unhook. You know, let's defuse from the thoughts. Let's take perspective. And what are the values based actions that you can take at that point? And there's no concept of where did you learn that? So that's kind of the, the you know, and that goes, that aligns yep. very well with coaching. So where do you, right. where do you see the value of asking that question? And then maybe we can get into, um, some of the dangers to avoid or when, you know, how far to take it. Like what's, what's good about saying, where'd you learn that or, or who did that to you? Yeah. Where do you think that you learned that pattern? I, I, I just always refer to these things as patterns, mm. not, you know, some embedded personality disorder. I think it's really inappropriate to use any kind of psychological jargon or labeling or anything like that. So a pattern is just a really good way to look at it. Um, Where'd you learn that pattern? And 
or where do you, you know, or who, who, who did that to you is, is a question that just make, wakes people up to the idea that, oh, maybe I developed this pattern because somebody did it to me. Maybe it, it really was something I learned. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I only bring it because a lot of times I will have a really high power person just suddenly sit back. I can see the whole change in their demeanor and they go, oh, um, yeah, no, I know exactly who was that person for me, Hmm. you know, was my explosive mother or my explosive father or this, you know, um, and, and then I say, well, I don't find the value necessarily in us spending time circling what your mom did to you or what your dad did to you, because I really want to keep all of this moving forward. But what I am feeling right now is like, I want to put my arm around you through the zoom because I want to say that must have been rough. Mm. And I've had um, men and women just well up with tears in that moment and say, yeah, it was awful, actually. And they might launch into a little bit of a story. I usually will try to listen and be really compassionate if they do. And then let's move forward. Let's take it to, okay, how can, so here's what I like to share with people at this juncture is what I will say. Mm. I have sat with so many people and all of us, and I am very, very candid with my clients about my own history in that I grew up with um, a mother who was depressed and who would hit us. Mm. And so I'm a great believer that there was and is some sort of history that's not positive in everyone's life. It's not a bed of roses. We all had a parent who, or two parents who, you know, ask any, any, um, yeah, I, I, I just, I mean, I that's so interesting because especially in sort of the, the, the world of high achievers in mm-hmm. our culture, there's a mm-hmm. very strong get over it ethos of like, there is. right? Like, yeah, you poor you, victim, world's smallest violin, right? Now what? And it's, mm-hmm. it feels dismissive, doesn't it? It does. But let me share this, that those patterns are just going like a neurological loop that cannot stop. And you will never escape those patterns until you have compassion for the part of you that chose that pattern. That pattern is a reactive pattern, and it's not about wallowing in it, examining in it, uh, examining it endlessly. It's not about therapizing. It's not, you know, forgive me for all the, the jargon. It is, though, about awareness. And, you know, since you referenced Terry Real earlier, you know, awareness is the key. When I'm sitting with somebody, you know, I mean, I have worked with clients who were systematically groomed and physically assaulted by a family member for two or three years in a row during the seven to nine-year-old phase of their life. Mm. And that has a massive impact on their ability to trust in the world. And they're also reactive. They're reactive. So when you can join alongside of them and help them to understand that 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 kid who was very old and wise, forgive me, eight, nine-year-olds, they, they have it. They know what's going on in the world. They're not missing things. Mm. That kid deserves to be understood and to get attention for the way that he had to adapt and react. So when you have that high-powered individual who's really reacting like that, if he can start to realize that that reaction is the part of him that wanted to run out of the room and couldn't, and or that had, you know, really visceral responses to feeling like screamed and yelled at by his parent, he starts to realize that he doesn't want to be that parent. He does not want to be that parent. And it shifts immediately when you, when he realizes that this was somebody else and he's taken their pattern and he's running with mm. it. He immediately goes, oh, my God. And then my next question is always, and you don't want to be that person, do you? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, no, I don't. I do not want to be that person. I am not that person. You can see them get worked up. 
I am not that person. I will not be that person. I'm not that way with my kids. And then sometimes they'll say, except when I lose it. Mm. And then I am that person with my kids. And all of a sudden the conversation gets more humid, human, it gets more personal. And, but then you have an hour with this person. So we've just hit a hot spot and we may have hit it, you know, 35 minutes in, we've only got 20 minutes left or 15, depending on your time slot. Um, and so I am always about, okay, I think this is a really big moment and we just need to put a punctuation mark here mm. because you are one of the most power. I will take a minute to witness them. You are one of the most powerful people I know, Howie. You're strong. You coach. You're always looking at what's going on with each individual. You so care. You're so compassionate. You're a brilliant strategist in your job. You know, whatever it is that I know that this person has, because I, I have really high power clients too that are juggling a lot of balls in their, in their jobs and it's their personal life that's falling apart. So they're trying to figure out how can they shift that? Mm. So it's, it's always about coming back to that place where you acknowledge how powerful they are. And then you acknowledge the inner wisdom. You have your own wisdom. The reason I ask so many damn questions is because I don't have the answers for you. I know that you have the answers and that your inner wisdom always knows this has been a blind spot and now it's not blind anymore. Mm. So how about that for opening a big crack in the door? And they usually just are like, whoa, I never thought of it that way. And they don't need to examine it. That's the piece. That's where I really take issue with the whole psychological approach. It's like, okay, we could do, you know, months and months in therapy and, and, you know, try to get them, you know, into a more, whole place with themselves, they don't, I don't find that they need that. Mm -hmm. They really need awareness because they can usually shift the pattern with awareness. And then the second part for me is helping them to get the neurological loop that takes it to its opposite. So whether it's criticism or control or contempt you know, when you have contempt for your spouse or contempt for your workers mm. that work under you, uh -huh. you, you really have to get some awareness on that because it won't shift on its own. So contempt is adaptive. Yes. Right. Can you draw the line? Like, you know, from, from that, the 18 month old to the seven to nine year old who's being groomed and abused. Like, how does how does that person turn into a, a, an adult who expresses contempt as a pattern? What does it do for them? Because the very fact that there are always many adults in their life who allowed the grooming and allowed the abuse to happen, and you can talk all day long about whether they knew or didn't know, but they allowed it. Mm. By their unconscious behavior, they allowed it. And that makes kids who feel out of control feel contempt for every last adult in their life, especially the abuser. And if you have an alcoholic father who comes home and you know, verbally abuses your mother in front of you, throws you upstairs to go to bed and then proceeds to rant around the house and knock down chairs and drink. And, you know, you're terrified. You are in a flight. You're in a fight or, you know, you're in a flight and you don't usually pull up the fight until you become an adolescent or you feel bigger and more powerful. But all of these have an impact. They have an impact and you will carry them forward. Mm -hmm. So how, how does the contempt serve? Like, what's the function of the contempt to keep that person as safe as possible? Contempt is when you've lost all respect for the person in front of you. Uh -huh. And the way that it's serving to keep you safe is it allows you to be in control in the judgment of things. You get to be the one that says, you're not good enough. You're not, mm. you know, you're not good enough. Uh-huh. So at a, cer at a certain and, point, like the, like, you know, infants kind of ha very young children in order to survive, have to believe the parents are right. Right. Yes. Like, OK, so if I was abused, then it must have been my fault or daddy was an alcoholic or daddy left because it was because of me, because it's right. too horrifying to think of the parents as not being. But at a certain age, a, a protection could be I'm I'm now asserting moral 
authority here, even though there's nothing I can do about it, I'm the one making the judgments and you people are contemptible. There's that. And there's also um, when somebody is acting in a contemptuous way toward you, they're um, demeaning you in a way that you feel not good enough in a very major way. So that the flip side of that, I don't feel good enough is to flip it Mm. to the place of either I'll show you, you know, um, and, or, um, yeah, the person who's really not good enough is you, Uh Uh but the pattern is simply a way of, of not having faith in the other, not being able to have faith in things. It's about the trust factor and contempt is, you know, contempt is when, you know, it's like criticism is, is level one and contempt is level two. Mm. So contempt is just the sister or brother to criticism. It's reached a new level where you now are treating that person with disregard. Mm-hmm. So I find they always go hand in hand. And so I will always circle back to the idea of criticism and where does that show up and is it functioning for you? Mm. I have an urge to... to broaden this slightly to the political. I, I don't know how dangerous that is. I don't know. I imagine we don't <laughs> disagree fundamentally about a lot of things. But what, what's coming to me is I just I just finished a book um, by Bill McKibben, who's a climate activist, who is he, it's, he wrote in 2019. It's called Falter. How the, the hum, is the human game playing itself out? And he talks about like, why is climate change so hard to deal with? It's not just the economics or the energy. So it's also an ideology of that was basically best expressed by Ayn Rand, the, the, the Russian American novelist who wrote, you know, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and The Virtues of Selfishness. And I remember reading those books in my early 20s and being quite captivated by them, like, like many are. And it was just this idea of like, like the heroes are basically cont- contemptuous of everyone who's not as ruthless and single-minded and talented as they are. And Bill McKibben points out like case after case of these leaders of industry in Silicon Valley, on Wall Street, who uh, lionize Ayn Rand and like take her books as their philosophy and give them out to all their friends as Christmas presents. And I wonder, do you, like, is contempt um, kind of a, 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 a feature of our society in a certain way? Oh boy, that's a huge box to unlock. Um, and you could decline. Like my brain doesn't have to go there. I just, it just came. Yeah, up there. I think I don't even want to open that, uh-huh. only because it is. Um, you know, we are certainly the more more polarized than ever before, and I think in terms of climate, we're really polarized. Um, and yeah, I, I just don't know if we're going to be able to take action yeah. fast enough. Yeah. Well, let me, let me let me generalize it to something I think is a more useful question for the individual. There there are certain adaptations that are good in our you know that our society tells us are good, right? So it's you know whether it's a certain type of selfishness or um, ruthless ambition or you know, being, you know, like people who are critical of other people on the internet, it's called throwing shade and they get lots of clicks and and views and advertising money. So like when we look at our, you know, if if you were to look at society as a whole and treat it as a person, like there's a, there's a lot of those adaptive child behaviors that's that we, I think, think of as culture. They're basically our civilization's operating system. They are, but I have um, a greater belief in the goodness of humanity and also of that a lot of people see that stuff, but they see through it too. And and a lot of the so-called shade is coming from younger people who just haven't found themselves and haven't found their niche and haven't found their way. And they're just trying to get notoriety and get seen. They're trying to be witnessed. Um, I think the desire to be seen and witnessed is number one priority for all of us. Oh. And so I think, you know, I'm, I'm not a believer that it, that it defines us. I, um, 
I definitely see the negativity, but I see a lot of positivity. I see a lot of people trying to make a difference. And I see a lot of people who have massive followings online um, that are putting out incredibly powerful content that's really, look at Jay Shetty, look at Lewis Howes, look at the people who are just putting out just impeccable, positive content all the time. Hmm. And so thank you for... Uh for balancing me <laughs> and, and also for, for, you know, would you say that one of the ways that each of us can bring about a more beautiful world is to, you know, work on ourselves so that we are able to see and witness others in their, in their goodness, yes. in their functionality, and even have compassion for their adaptive parts? It is the drive of my practice. I actually love uncovering the absolute jewel that each human being is and helping them to not only see it, but live it, breathe it, be it, because they are so powerful. Mm. And any adaptive behaviors they have, any of the baggage that may define the ways that their life isn't working for them, they're all things that they can get aware of. They're all things that they can get in control of. I mean, there is like power in each and every one of us, like in every cell. And so I, I just think, yes, you're right. It's, a, it's about uncovering the jewels of who we are and how we can be the very best self that we can be in order to enable, a, you know, this sounds very cosmic because I don't really hold it this way, but I do on another level, believe that when each one of us is contributing at the highest level of who we are, the entire world, the entire organism, if you will, changes for the better. Mm. And so, yeah. And I mean, it's even like, I, I don't know, I keep mentioning people online because if you ever follow Gary V on, on Instagram, the guy is rude and in your face, but he's brilliantly compassionate, brilliantly sensitive. And he is giving a message that says, quit the false illusions, quit the BS. Quit the trying to jump over the next guy to get to your next success. Quit the, quit the shortcuts. Mm. You know, everything takes work, but it, it takes dedication. But don't lose yourself in thinking there's a fast fix or that you can, you know, use power over others. Mm. You know, he's, he's, his message is amazing. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, just, you know, when you say it's like this cosmic thing, like, you know, like if I just try to imagine the world without humans in it, like everything would work. Like it would still be like yeah, forests mm -hmm. and meadows and oceans and like schools of fish and birds. Like it would be beautiful, right? Like, and- Yeah, the planet would come back in a hurry. <laughs> and that's just every creature being its best self. Like, like we're, we're yes. the ones, there's a beautiful line from a, a um, David White poem. It says, you know, why are we are the one terrible part of creation privileged to refuse our flowering. You know. Yes. And, and so let's go back to that history then. That is the thing that makes the refusal of the flowering. When you have a wound, that wound stays with you. Even if it felt like it wasn't, you know, your parents never got divorced. My parents never got divorced. Mm. You know, your parents never got divorced. You had a good high school and college. You went to college. You know, you had opportunity. You find yourself thinking, well, what have I got to complain about? <laughs> but the truth is, you know, wounds exist for people and they have an emotional impact and they definitely, you know, I know a lot of people who are very hard on themselves. Like I'm a real high performance person. I get stuff done, but I've always been very hard on myself. Mm. And somebody pointed that out to me recently. And I remember just kind of sitting there and kind of going, Ooh, I've been seen, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's sometimes in those moments when you're seen, if the person isn't judging you, they're just witnessing, mm. it can be transforming. So that is my job as a coach is to witness in a way that doesn't shame that doesn't blame. I don't want to go blame their mom. I don't want to go blame them. I don't want to blame anybody. But it, it opens a door to a different level of understanding and awareness that can break patterns in a New York minute. Mm. 
mm-hmm. in terms of their ability to shift things. Mm-hmm. Now, I have I have clients who have and are aware of dysfunctional patterns, and they are mm-hmm. they can be fused with them. They could think like I can't. That, that's been the reason for my success, as opposed to they were successful in spite of that thing. And, and I'm wondering, are there people that you you know? Okay, yeah, I get I get angry, but boy, it motivates everyone and it keeps people on their toes. And yeah, my father did that, and my father, you know, disciplined me harshly, and I'm glad. Like, you know, if he hadn't done that, God knows where I'd be today. Like, do you ha- do you work with people who are defending their adaptations a lot? I do. I absolutely do. Um, uh, what's your play? You know, I think it's. Um, well, my play is to let them hold it for a while. Uh-huh. I don't actually try to jump in because then that's the judgment again. Mm. If I try to jump in and say, oh, Howie, I don't believe that. Um, you know, I'm sorry, but that's not, you know, all it does is make them feel like I just shamed them or that, you know. So I will keep moving in the process until we hit another roadblock mm. and there's something going there that relates to this other piece and say, you know, well, how does this fit with, you know, I know your dad was always really critical of you and really hard on you. And that drove you and that made you successful in ways that you don't believe you'd be successful. But I got to tell you, my honest take on you, Howie, is that you would have been successful if you crawled out from under a rock because you have boom, 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 boom. Mm and being able to give them my bullet list of how powerful they are and why that's so powerful. So I think you were powerful despite your father. And often it's so huge just to be seen in a way that's compassionate and that says, no, your father didn't do this. You did Mm. this. They there. I've just seen grown men and women well up with tears and just be like, wow, I never thought of it that way. And I don't let myself believe that. I don't, I, I don't hold that. And I said, yeah, I, I can see that you don't hold it because you're, it's still outside of you. You still believe that you only got there because you were yelled at, mm. told you had to get there. But the truth is you bootstrapped yourself. You're the one that worked for low wages for six years after college and developed your own app and did this and did that and did that. Did you know, and, and so it's, it's always, for me, coaching is always about witnessing the individual, which is therapy, but, but it isn't therapy because I don't want to wallow in their past. I want to build their sense of self so that they really understand mm-hmm. they can do anything. So let's get busy and do it. Let's not thank your father anymore because he didn't do this. Right. So it reminds me in terms of the type of education so, you know, so when I'm teaching people about exercise and, and diet, for example, mm-hmm. I will refer to our evolutionary past to explain why they have a sweet tooth, why they don't want to get off the couch. And in terms of mm-hmm. su- survival, as you know, these are adaptations. And so what you're doing here mm-hmm. is just sort of customizing them to, to, to the individual's origins and their uh, yes. the environment in which they were raised in addition to, OK, we're humans coming from a line of humans who lived on the savannah and you had to, you know, you ate whatever you could find whenever you could find it. And you remembered where the good stuff was. And that's why, you know, you salivate when you think about going to Home Depot because they have Snicker bars at the checkout counter. Right. So, yeah. so it's all. Um, now, one of the problems with that is that, that when I talk to people about that, there, there are ways in which people can internalize that story and say, well, it's hopeless. Right. I'm genetically programmed to behave in a certain way and doing anything else is going to be a really uphill battle. You're saying something different about learned patterns. Right. It's never hopeless. It's not only not hopeless, but it's the awareness of it always comes back to awareness of how the pattern developed and how they how it served them, but how it no longer does. Hmm. Because. The power is theirs now. It isn't about this adaptive behavior being the thing that drives the power. Mm -hmm. Being mean to your employees isn't powerful. Uh, So so I feel I have a real good sense of how you use the past 
to inform and motivate present and future without getting stuck in it and without uh, before we jump jump ahead you are a trained therapist are there things that, that if to, for coaches who are listening to this who are not trained in clinical practice should avoid or not do or signs that they need to get help if we if we even open the door for you know where do you think you learned that or who did that to you you know, I think that I'm, I'm a trained therapist. I'm also a trained coach. And so I also, I really believe that when you see coaches that are also clinically trained, you have a real different hybrid. Um, and there's the ability to, to see and examine, but not get, not circle, not get stuck there. Mm. And I also feel that for for John and I, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, but the process of writing our book, we spent six years talking about the secrets. Mm. And that was six years of therapy and coaching that I was personally doing. So I had a lot of thoughts on what works and what doesn't work. And what are the key, what are the key elements that we see that are really important to all relationships, not just marriages, but these are really key things. And they're all neurological. You know, you can either be in gratitude and appreciation for the person you love and constantly be letting them know the ways that you appreciate them, which totally warms up the relationship. Or you can be in that critical place of like, babe, I love you, but you got to lose that 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, who needs that to say to them while you're eating a plate of pasta? You know, <laughs> I mean, but people do that stuff in their relationships all the time because those unconscious patterns drive unconscious behavior, which takes you into the neurological loop that's negative, that was part of your adaptive decisions. Right. And, and so that's where it, where it really comes from. And in relationship, it, it spins into sort of predictable repetition pretty quickly. Well, and relational theory is that all of life is relationship. It doesn't matter whether you're at work, whether you're online, whether you're in with your kids, whether you're with your spouse, you know, whoever you're with, whether you're with the person who's checking you out at the grocery store, you're having a relationship in that moment. How are you going to behave? Are you going to be short with them? Are you going to be kind? Who, are you, who do you want to be? That's the other question I ask people all the time. Who do you want to be in the world? Tell me about powerful Howie. Mm. <laughs> you know, because... I just, you know, I love to watch my clients blossom. I love to watch my clients step into their power in ways that they never even dreamed they could because they suddenly start to live in the part of them that is truly powerful. These adaptive patterns have served them, but waking up to the ways that they don't serve them opens up the gates of power for them. Mm. So... You mentioned earlier that you want to shift the neurological loops to the opposites of the adaptive behaviors. Can you talk for just a, we have a few minutes left. Can you just talk for a few minutes on how you do that? Uh, I really just, I, I, I'm an educator as much as I'm a coach and I, or a therapist. I find that education is power. And so I will take a moment in a coaching session to say, may I, may I take a teaching moment here? Mm. Um, and they always say yes. Um, I even have little handouts that I share with people, but things like, um, you know, your, your, your brain is always cutting new grooves and whatever you train it, wherever you train it to go, that's where it will go. And so you can either decide to train it in, on the negative track, or you can, you know, which is the track of like, let's go have a fast food hamburger. And then after that, let's have a shake. Or you can train it in the positive groove of like, I'm not really hooked on these green drinks, but I really like it when I put the blueberries and banana and it's palatable and good. So I'm going to do that today. Mm -hmm. So you just, you know, it's just uh, either or decisions, but um, you know, I, I, I find that it's, it's just helping people to get back to that awareness of what is it, how is this pattern serving you or not serving you so that they can yeah. shift it. And so helping them to go from criticism to appreciation is simply giving them actions to do. 
I, okay, so let's say we have somebody that is, is a critical boss, then maybe the actions would be, you know, I want you to find, you know, I want you to read the one minute manager, find them doing some, catch them doing something right. Mm. And then I want you to take time every day to find one thing that you appreciate about the five employees that you have direct contact with and actually go tell them why you appreciate it and that you think they're doing a good job mm. and watch how they respond. And, you know, so it's just actual little goals mm. that we're setting. And then the next session we'll talk about, you know, what did you do? What happened and how did it work? And those stories are often really amazing because they're often shocked and surprised. Mm. So then understanding in the teaching moment that when you change a neurological loop from negative to positive, you're helping them to change the way their brain thinks instead of the way that it's reacting. Mm. So what I notice is that you're not necessarily trying to intervene in the hardest moment of them being triggered. So the way, the way I think about this is when I'm working with people, I can either teach them how to say no to the candy bar, or I could teach them to add some salad, right? So with the idea that the, the good mm -hmm. stuff can eventually change your self image a little bit, your identity, you can pay attention to how you feel when you eat it, and it'll start to crowd out the bad stuff, right? So, so that's what I'm hearing. So like do the one minute manager thing, but not necessarily like do the one minute manager thing the moment you feel like exploding at someone. Am I... Am I getting that right? Yeah, I, I think it's 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 simpler than that because I think if we're if we're just trying to bring in the salad, we're just trying to add something that might add value in that moment or that might just distract them or bring something good in versus trying to when I say I sidle up to them, I, I will commiserate with somebody about the candy bar. But then I also will be like, but here's here's the contract you made with me around what we were going to work on. So I just want to remind you of the standards of integrity you agreed to and the things that you said you wanted to do. So the question is, you know, do, you know, is this, is this going to serve where you want to get to? Right. And then, so, so and I know it sounds like I'm coming back to the place that's critical, Yeah. but I, I always want to keep asking questions so that they can come to that conclusion on their own. Right. I think what I'm asking about is like when they are in the heat of the moment, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the tools that you work with them on so that they have they can have awareness? Right. Because we know that when you're when you're in fight, flight or freeze, your you know, your neocortex is essentially shut down the part of you that can handle all this stuff. So I'm wondering, like, what are, what are some techniques you use to help people? have a choice when it often feels like even today, like I'm, you know, I've been doing work on myself and I've been coaching and training for 30 years. You know, when I get triggered, I become an irrational asshole and there's no, <laughs> there's no way I'm going to think my way out of that. It's got to be breath or body or, or some sort of interruption mm -hmm. that can get me back into a place of neurological safety. Um, and, you know, even today I'd say I'm, you know, C plus, <laughs> Right. In, in terms of like where I'd like to get. And so I'm wondering, like, do you have, do you have any advice for me or tricks or, you know, you know, when I'm feeling, you know, triggered? the breathing is the breathing is a big one. I really try to help people when they feel triggered. Um, and let, let me just explain something that happens in couples therapy is that um, sometimes uh, one one person in the couple will be so triggered by the other person that they will literally freeze up. Mm. and they they can't even respond they're so emotionally it's called flooding mm. so i will also teach about flooding because flooding is real flooding happens to people um and to help them understand that flooding is flooding is just a moment of the minute you can feel you're flooded of taking time to breathe and to step back immediately from the moment in whatever situation it is so that you can breathe. And so I encourage people to walk away in that moment, not to continue the conversation, to stop themselves and go to their office, have a glass of water, make a cup of tea, breathe a little, think about what just happened and not to get into a place of shame, but rather into a place of, hey, I just stopped that. I didn't take it to the next level. Mm. Because that's... Um, 
Yeah, it's a hard one, Howie. I, it, that's a deeper, it takes, I'll just say that's a longer process in, in coaching because I feel that we all have that place in us that kind of can get into self-hatred and, and, um, and holding ourselves accountable in ways that are not very fun or healthy. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm imagining in couples work, there's, there's some dangers of, right? Like, you know, you, you do the psychoeducation and you learn about some of your partner's patterns and then all of a sudden that becomes another cudgel, right? You know, in relation with the other person or even in relation with yourself, like, oh, Howie, you did that damn thing again. No, actually, I find that um, it, it raises compassion in the opposite partner. And um, in fact, I'm working with a couple right now that I just love this couple so much. And they both really, really want it to work. And one person really, they both have difficult issues in their past. But one of them, those issues rise up in a way where there's reactions. Mm -hmm. um, and the other person is so compassionate about it now, really sees it for what it is, and really understands that it's not about them personally. Um, and I think that, that when you get to those moments, you're starting to make real gains. And I don't even see them together. So it, it ends up being that each conversation can be like, well, what happened? And what did you do? And how did you feel? And and okay, so what do we want? To, where do we want to take this from here? How are we shifting this? How do you want to work on this? And that's another question I ask a lot. How do you want to work on this? Because the minute a client says, I want to start being nice to myself again, I don't think I've ever been nice to myself. Mm. That's, that's a, I mean, you've just taken a quantum leap because that is, you know, and I, and I see it a lot. I mean, in type A's, those really hard driving people, they aren't nice to themselves. They drive themselves to the end of the earth. They're judging themselves every step of the way. And they're comparing themselves to others. They have a lot of dysfunctional monkey mind, if you will. Yeah. They have a lot of ways that they're thinking that are perpetuating that those belief systems for themselves. So... You know, one of my phrases that I use with my clients is, I am willing to be kind, compassionate, helpful, but it, you know, whatever it is they want to be, mm. but the, but the, you know, here's the thing. When you say an affirmation, Howie, let me ask you a question right now. Yeah. When you say, I am a great guy, always even tempered and incredibly <laughs> strong, what does your brain say to you? Yeah, the bullshit to, uh, alarm just went off. Yeah, yeah, your brain, your brain says, liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay, but what happens when you say, I am willing to be truly compassionate with myself? Mm -hmm. Then it's aspirational. It's not, it's not a, there's, it's, it's not trying to be an objective fact. It's a decision. Right. Well, research shows that just putting willing into the I am statements of anything you mm. want, I am willing to be wealthy beyond measure. I am willing to blank, blank, blank. Those are affirmations that your brain welcomes in and says, yeah, let me think of some new ways to get wealthy. Wow, I like that idea. Yeah, I'm willing. I'm willing. Well, for, when you I know, hear that. Whatever it yeah, is. When I hear that, the, yeah. what I really think of is, oh, I, like, I can identify 31 ways that I'm unwilling to be wealthy right now. Right? Like ways, right. ideas about wealth, ideas right. about- Right, but that's your- Right. So, so to, that's the negative neurological loop. Yeah. So to say that's the negative neurological loop. So do you want to give the time to the negative neurological loop or the positive one? Right. So when I say when, when I say I am willing, then that puts me in the ring. Then, then the two the, yes. the two of the, the yes. two of them are right up there, and you know the negative ones have value too. Like there's you know they're they're wrapped around compassion they're wrapped around fairness they're they're right there it's not you know like it's an inter it's an it's a conversation to be had that for the first thing i have to do in order to adjudicate it is define wealth and wealthy right because because it's like people who don't believe i would say that the first thing that needs to happen is you need to forgive yourself <laughs> for for whatever privilege you feel you have. Uh-huh. Because what I'm hearing is, is um, you know, 
well, <laughs> we're on a podcast. I just feel yeah, like go for it. I, Please go I, for you it. Know, okay. I, I just find that um, that a lot of us carry um, shame and guilt around just having because there's so much not having in this world. There's so much unfairness. And I find that it can really limit our ability to move forward and be fabulously successful, happy and, and healthy and wealthy because we are holding ourselves back. We are limiting in some way our, our ability to be, our happiness, if you will because it's not fair. Right. Well, I don't know how much of, of me you can see, but I'm wearing a t-shirt that is, pr is pretty much a, a spot on metaphor for that, which is, it's a it's a P for my alma mater, Princeton, mm -hmm. but it's also in, in yes. kente cloth, and it's it's the African Students Association at Princeton. So I'll, I'll wear a Princeton shirt, but only in solidarity with Africa. Yes, so, yep, so. yep. Okay. Well, your mother did a good job. <laughs> she she got that guilt oh, in yeah. there. Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just it's, I have to say for anyone who's listening, it's the it's one of the things I adore about you. You're also very transparent and you're very very authentic, and it's refreshing. I'll bet your clients adore you. Uh, I could ask them. <laughs> it's never it's never come up on, on the uh, the exit surveys. How adorable was I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I feel... uh, well, I, I put a high value on authenticity because to me, the true art of coaching is being authentic with your client and being, and being able to hold a really compassionate space for them to grow, learn, and move forward and, and to really go after the things that matter to them. And everyone has, you know, there's a difference between goals and tasks. Goals are things that bring you joy. Mm. Goals are things that make you go, yeah, I want to wake up every morning and do that. Whereas tasks are just like the to-do list. And yes, you have to complete tasks to get to the, the juice of the goals, but let's not, let's not you know, get them confused. Right. right. But I mean, for what comes to me is like that kind of authenticity and transparency is the, is the only way I can hold what my clients bring me because I'm not brilliant and better than them and smart like i'm not any of the things that we we kind of imp, you know imprint want to imprint on a helper right like you know the guru complex and well that's the beauty of being a good coach though because a good coach knows that they are not the wisdom <laughs> a good coach knows the wisdom is sitting in the chair opposite yeah. them and your job is only to uncover it yes yes and you know so for for me like feeling like I had, if, if I feel like I had anything to hide or like, I'm, I'm just not that good. <laughs> you know, right. I, I don't I, think any of us. I is. agree. I understand. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm hey, not a psychopath. I canceled or, my or clients. Yeah. I was recently sick and I canceled all my clients because you know what, if you can't bring your best self, you shouldn't be there. So. Uh, any, any, I've loved this conversation. Too, anything we didn't get to that you, you would like to have expressed? No, I think we unwrapped a lot of stuff. I think it's a deep conversation. I think that, um, you know, I personally believe everyone has history that has some element of not just trauma, but just, you know, things that we had to learn and adapt to things that we had to process. We had to figure out and, you know, we all developed behaviors and ways of being in the world that, you know, we're in response to all of that. So I think it's, I think it's a conversation that just opens up people's minds to the idea that you're not just the guy looking back at you in the mirror right now. It, there's a much deeper self yeah. underneath all of our outer persona. Yeah. And what, and what it does for me fundamentally, as I hear you talk about it, it leeches out any shame right yes, like i can have guilt over specific things that i've done and repairs that i need to make but it's not mm -hmm. you know like oh okay this is why i didn't you know you can't blame the 18 month old for the decision they right. made pre you know pre-linguistically 
Like, oh, okay. Like, yes. I think that your whole uh, approach and worldview opens the door logically to some self-compassion, which is, is where you said I the would, healing begins. Yeah. I, I would not only agree, but I find that um, that wisdom really is in each individual. And when the door starts to open up, they have aha after aha, and they start moving their life forward. And you start to see the goals and the behavior shift and change, and they start really going, oh, I didn't realize. And and since I work a lot with relationships, both parents to children, you know, couples, you know, individuals um, dealing with their boss, dealing with their life, but relationships, because um, all of life is relational, um, I find that when people really understand that it's a neurological loop and that it could, you can live in the positive side of it, you don't, and it's not Pollyanna, um, they, they start to experience more joy in their relationships. And as they're bringing appreciation and gratitude and things like that into their relationships, the relationship starts to warm up and the perks back to them are so powerful. And um, I've had people that practiced from our book only one partner in the couple. And then after three or four months, the, the relationship had warmed up and changed so profoundly that the other partner read the book and was like, you know, I thought this was a bunch of pop, you know, this was like a little pop, yeah. uh, pop book, you know, like, oh, you know, yeah, we're just going to give you the five secrets and you're going to be great, you know, <laughs> and, and they instead came back, read the book and loved the book, kind of studied the secrets and started bringing them the other way to their spouse who had already been practicing for three months. And the whole relationship shifted in a way that was multi-generational in its dynamic because a, pa a pattern that had been there for the husband had also been there for his father, his grandfather, and his grandfather before that. They had all been the patriarch who was difficult. And it just, everything changed. It was just, it was fascinating to watch. Right. Yeah. My, my wife is a, you know, an acolyte of some shamanic traditions and believes in you can mm -hmm. heal the past. Like, oh, yes. <clears throat> right. Yes. Like when <clears throat> when you take a stance to stop the right. trauma from moving forward. Yes, uh, it's profound. Oh, it's so true. And it, and it really does shift everything because the future is always interacting with the past, whether, you know, I mean, quantum physics knows it right, is. Right. And, you know, my, my co-author and I joke that, you know, the, the self-help books is like, oh, I know someone who needs to read that so they can be better to me. <laughs> right. So I, right. I, I, I love that, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, like when I, when I started reading The Go-Giver Marriage, I'm like, oh, just give, them my, give this to my wife. And then <laughs> like, like it's an item on the to-do list. Like you know, who's going to mow the lawn? Who's going to read the book on you know, the secrets of a loving marriage. Right. And that's the transactional scorekeeper that, you know, people want to employ in all their relationships. It's like, you know, I did this for you and therefore you need to do this for me, mm. you know, and, or, you know, I need you to read this because it's you that needs to change. Right. <laughs> oh. right. You know, and gosh, I'm, I'm just um, transposing all that onto the work I've done with people around health where the relationship with their self is the same way. Like I just ate a salad. Now you're going to, you know, you're going to eat it or, you know, you just ate the salad. So I get to have the donut or, you know, right. like the different parts of ourselves in this exact same conversation right. as, as if it's a dysfunctional marriage. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's again, a transactional way of dealing with yourself. I ate the salad. So now I get the donut mm -hmm. and it, it's like, well, that's an either or, but it's not, it's not a win-win. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Anna Gabriel, yeah. man, it's such a joy to talk to you. I feel like this has been, you know, an hour of professional development plus 13 minutes of um, free coaching for me. <laughs> so I, I appreciate all of that. I hope, I hope other fi folks, um, you know, can um, get as much out of it as I have. And so how do people find out more about you, either to get your book or to work with you as their coach or if you train coaches? So we're, okay. give us the, the scoop. Our book is available. Yeah, our book is available anywhere. They can get it at Amazon, Barnes, anywhere. But it's also available on our website, which is gogiver.com. 
and um, or excuse me, gogivermarriage.com. My husband just corrected me from the background. Yeah, I, 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 um, I was go, thinking that uh, the, the yeah. co-author would have. Go give her marriage. Yeah, go gogivermarriage.com is our website. And um, there you can find uh, links and, and a calendar to get to my coaching. Okay. And there's also um, information about our workshop that we do called Living the Five Secrets to Lasting Love. And there is also information about our, our coaches training program, which begins in January. All right, January 2023. Uh, yep. Is it online or, or live or in person? It's going to be online. Okay. It's going to be pretty extensive and, and it's a real live, you know, in-depth coaching program. But it's um, definitely going to be online because we have people from Australia, Great Britain, Germany, Sweden. We have people all over the world, as well as a bunch of people in the U.S. that have already applied to be in the program. So awesome! All right, I'll I'll put all that on the the show notes for the for this episode. I will check it out myself. All right, so, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Have a fabulous day. Hi to John. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You take Bye. care. <laughs>